which was in um, Warrington Township, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I'm just going to be running through um, site history, project goals, and then we have already started um, design and construction. Well, we've finished design, we're in construction. Um, and then just talking about the next steps. So this is Lions Pride Park um, overall. In the center we've got, um, we have a really great uh, recreational space, kids playground, surrounded by um, uh, rec fields, and then in the northern portion, um, this glowing fluorescent area is the subject of our project, Lion Strike Park Pond. And this is the very beautiful pond um, from the ground. Um, as you can see, it's in quite the state. Um, it is a 2.3 acre impounded water body um, that is in line with two tributaries um, to Little Nishamity Creek Watershed. Uh, this is in the Delaware River Watershed, so not Schuylkill River, but um, still, still a good project for the area. And as you can see, um, we started with just a very stagnant water body that was completely choked full of sediments and invasive species. We've got water chestnut that you can see is um, on the left-hand side, watermelon, duckweed, and kind of the back right. And these invasive species, they, um, they limit light from going through the water column. They um, reduce um, space for native flora to, um, to flourish, and they just provide um, a much degraded habitat um, for fish and wildlife. So um, one of the species, specifically the water chestnut, um, this water body does flow to um, a downstream Bradford Reservoir. And the Bucks County Conservation District has spent tons of money in the 2000s um, to remove tons and tons um, of water chestnut. And here you have a source that is feeding right into that reservoir, counterproductive to their previous efforts. Um, so we definitely saw this as a threat to the Neshaminy Creek watershed and Delaware River, as did Warrington Township. Um, so there is a great near need here to restore this area. So before I dive into the project, which is wetland restoration, um, I want to go through how this system functions. Any you know important any project that we're working on, it's always very important for us to understand what our existing conditions are, um, so that we understand the system that we're restoring. So you have two unnamed tributaries to Little Nishamley Creek that are flowing into the water body. The pond itself is impounded by three berms, and the water is controlled by an outlet structure in the bottom right-hand corner. And this outlet structure was prone to clogging. So basically, during any kind of storm event, this system was backing up, and water would be overtopping this southern berm. And this caused flooding in the adjacent um, lacrosse field, but it also caused over time for a breach to form in this berm. And it eroded, eroded to a point where it actually was a lower elevation than the outlet structure itself. So this became then the control for the pond. So you have constant water flowing through this area. And if you can kind of just imagine a line across this bank, all of those sediments um, have eroded. That's um, you know sediments that are being put to downstream water body and all the nutrients associated with them, like phosphorus. And then um, there was a second area a little bit further upstream that was also overtopping, and this created the formation of this erosional swale. Um, the township did try to um, you know, maintain this a little bit so that storm flows weren't um, flooding the cross field as much, but this was actively head cutting and in no way stabilized, um, so just an ongoing issue. Also, we had these um, kind of like a straight path from where the tributaries are coming in to where the outlet structure is. And 
that creates a flushing issue. So none of the water basically within this northern portion of this pond was ever getting flushed out. Um, so sediments are accumulating in this area. You have um, this really stagnant water condition, and this is where water chestnut, water mule duckweed, this is where they thrive. Um, so that's kind of our starting point. Warrington Township <clears throat> knew this was an issue. They reached out to Princeton Hydro, and together we applied for a grant from DCNR um, that we were awarded, um, and they funded 50% of this project with a one-to-one -one match. And the goals of the project are to convert this pond into a diverse wetland complex, wetland and open water complex, that provides um, diverse habitat conditions for fish and wildlife. Um, it's really important for us to improve the water quality. We wanted to reduce total sediment solids going downstream, reduce nutrients associated with those, and um, of course, attack these invasive species that were overrunning the system. Same time, make sure that we were addressing the flooding that was going in the adjacent lacrosse field. And then the thing that was unique about this grant was it was very heavily focused on um, providing equal access for all members of the community, regardless of your um, physical ability. So the whole goal of the project was to make sure all of our recreational components were ADA compliant. So after many, many months of permitting and design, um, this was our final plan um, that we moved forward with. Um, the primary objective, as I had mentioned, is to create a wetland complex. So the first things first, we had to make sure that we had the requisite hydrology for wetland conditions. This was all an open water body. Um, so we needed to lower the water surface elevation by about two feet. Um, we did that by modifying the outlet structure. As you can see um, in the blue area, um, we did elongate the flow path coming in from these tributaries to reach the northern portion of the pond. And that provided the requisite um, flushing conditions so that we don't get as much stagnant water in this system. And then the varying um, colors of green that you can see are the different ecological communities. So we've got state open water that's open water in blue. We've got inundated emergent wetland moving out from that, emergent wetland, scrub shrub, and then forested wetland. The um, challenge with lowering the water surface elevation is we were worried about the streams coming into the system basically head cutting and eroding. So we incorporated this into our design um, through a ripple pool sequence. Um, so that's basically um, a natural feature that you would see in the stream. Um, it creates opportunities for product growing vertebrates to thrive uh, within the ripples, and then areas for fish resting or other um, aquatic species um, to rest um, in the pools. We reconfigured the berm itself um, to make it higher um, to keep the lacrosse field from flooding, um, but then also to provide additional wetlands in this southern area. Um, we you know, are very aware of the fact that storm flows are higher um, and flashier these days, so we did need to come up with a plan for all that water to go in the event of a heavy storm. So a secondary spillway was designed um, to basically control those heavy storm flows um, to the adjacent forested wetland um, so that the, the southern area wouldn't flood. And then these are our path networks. Um, we have this really awesome boardwalk that goes out into the center of the pond um, with a big observation platform where people can fish or just enjoy the um, restored setting um, with educational signage out there about the importance of um, wetlands um, and then this path network, which was configured on top of the berm, all ADA compliant. Okay, so that's the design. Um, and so we just, we, is, we... Is that all water chestnut or it's fire rock? The left-hand side is all water chestnut. Ah, yeah. And then in the back, it's, yeah, watermelon duckweed. So we went from this 
um, to this, which I know it's not like the prettiest yet. Um, one of the reasons that it looks so barren at the moment, um, we actually uh, had our pre-construction meeting in June of 2023. And we're going to kick off for a summer fall construction, but the boardwalk took um, some delays, and so it pushed us back to a fall construction, fall winter construction. So we can't plant in the middle of winter. Um, so we have to come back and plant in May. But this does very much mimic our design. So you guys actually built the boardwalk first before all the construction, or you did the construction? You just have to do the plant. It all happened hand in hand, yeah. um, so so that they didn't have to mobilize like the big equipment twice, because yeah. um, that would have been more expensive. We did the boardwalk basically right after grading. Okay. Um, and another interesting thing about I guess this before I dive in is that one of the ways that we made this project more affordable is we didn't transport any sediments off-site, and we didn't bring in any clean sediments. Um, so that basically enabled us to do the project because we're not paying for all those trucking costs, but as we'll talk about, then you're dealing with the historic seed bank um, in the old, yeah, in the old, old soils, so all those water chestnut seeds were still in there, and that, that came with the project. Um, so, here we are, um, you know, these are the different steps of construction that we went through and are going to go through with planting. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the, what I think are the more interesting components. Um, so the project basically kicked off with dewatering the system. We had to control all this water. So a copper dam was installed across the incoming tributaries and the water was redirected, um, basically circumventing the pond and discharged downstream um, through uh, these giant sediment filter bags. And the filter bags, they you know control all the sediments from going down, but they also control any kind of fine particulate matter like um, algae, um, duckweed. Um, so. That was done in a, in a stabilized, in a non-erosive manner. And then during any storm events while we were out there doing construction, um, we had this basically bypass um, for water to move through so that the pond wasn't being flooded um, while we were out there moving the mud. Um, so yeah, this is a picture. It was a mucky, terrible mess. Um, but they did allow it to settle for a couple weeks before they went out there. Um, and this is, you know, a picture of basically what it looks like to just move around muck in a dewatered pond. Um, we're trying to create these different habitat conditions for the open water, the inundated emergent wetland, emergent scrub shrub and forest. Um, so they did actually utilize some materials that were already on site. Um, we had to clear a certain patch of forest to create the spillway, so that was used, um, those logs were used to stabilize the muck um, for the dozers to drive over. Um, but actually, during this phase, there was no heavy storm events, so um, nature kind of cooperated with us on this, and um, it was it was completely relatively quick. All that in was legacy sediment that was in the Exactly. We well, didn't, take didn't have to truck it off site and use it there. Yeah, one option would have been to take the mud off, you know, the legacy sediments yeah. off site and bring in clean fill, but that would have been prohibitively well, the expensive. The legacy sediment has nutrients. I mean, it does. Yeah. Well, are you familiar with the Big Spring Run project in Lancaster? No. Yeah. Well, that was the opposite. They hauled it all off. Yeah. And great expense. It's expensive. I mean, I don't know exactly what it costs to move soil, but I mean, it would have been tens of thousands of dollars. Um, the outlet structure, um, this is the same outlet. So basically, we just cut out the face. You can kind of see the before and then right to the right, top right. You can see where we cut out the face um, to lower, and that lowered the water surface elevation two feet. 
and we installed this trash rack. Um, pretty simple solution um, to creating the right hydrology conditions. As I mentioned, we wanted to make sure that we were stabilizing these two tributaries that were coming in. Um, so the red circles are a frame of reference. Um, we had several goals associated with these, um, this, these tributaries. Um, so number one was minimizing tree disturbance. As I'm sure a lot of you know, streams are amazing at stabilizing stream banks. Um, their root systems are extremely important. So we didn't want to be, you know, mucking things up by cutting down trees um, and ruining what was already a stable system out there. Um, so we also um, wanted to make sure, because there's a wetland complex upstream of the system, we wanted to make sure that any of the changes that we made wasn't modifying the hydrology of the wetlands upstream um, and that we were maintaining the existing channel length and alignment. Um, so these are all things that we're thinking about during construction and we were able to achieve all these goals. Um, we had a great contractor, um, our aquatic resource restoration company um, that we worked with and this is what the ripple pool system looked like after it was done. This picture was taken before we installed live stakes, um, but these bank banks were all planted with, um, I think, black willow, red osier dogwood, and um, silky dogwood live stakes. Um, this is a picture of the public access that was installed. So again, all of these walking paths are ADA compliant. Um, that's a picture of the boardwalk after um, went in. I went out there a couple weeks ago with my son, and we ran on the boardwalk, and there were all these um, like fish and turtles all over the place. So you can see the wildlife <coughs> is kind of returning to the site. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight, um, you know, we've already talked about the soils haven't been taken off site, so that was a great cost savings. But where we were also able to reuse a lot of the on-site materials. Um, so the park itself, Warrington Township, had this massive stockpile of soil that they just had sitting there and they didn't really know what to do with, with it. Um, so we were able to incorporate that into our design. They had a lot of large rocks that had been stockpiled, um, so these were all nice cost savings. The trees that were removed from the spillway, um, we incorporated them, as I mentioned earlier, as stabilization measures for the dozers during construction, but also used them um, to create these habitat features throughout the pond. Um, so the bottom photo there, um, it's a great basking habitat for turtles, um, resting area for birds that are in the area. And we did see um, basically right away during construction, the birds were having a good time eating all the fish and whatnot that had been dewatered. Um, so they, they never really left the area. Um, we saw lots of blue herons and red-tailed hawks. Um, in this top left photo, um, one of the things that we were able to address that wasn't really planned for um, was the water from the adjacent lacrosse field. It was supposed to be going to this rain garden, to the stormwater basin, um, but it never really <coughs> did that. It, it kind of just circumvented, went around the basin, and went straight into the pond. Um, so we were able to work with the township and the contractor, and they just created this little swale um, with the erosion fabric, um, and now that water from the lacrosse field and the playground is correctly going to the rainwater. Um, as I mentioned, the water chestnut was, is a concern. So we did have a couple of storm events um, while we were out there. Um, once we finished grading and the pond um, started to kind of fill up during these higher flows, all of those <coughs> water chestnut pods started floating to the surface. And this was a concern because, um, as I mentioned, Bradford Reservoir right downstream, you know, they've done so much great work to get rid of water chestnut. It would be completely counterproductive to our project if we are not able to address this issue. Um, 
So we did a lot of brainstorming on how to get rid of it. Um, we didn't want to do a, uh, to do herbicide treatment because we're going to be planting inundated emergent plants, so like floating aquatic species. And we had concerns about those herbicides and killing off our plantings. Um, so that was out. Um, we decided manual removal was the best thing to do, but we didn't have money for it. So we applied for a Palms Mini Grant, uh, which was awarded last week. Um, it's about $9,000, and ARC is going to go back in and manually remove this water chestnut. I don't think it's going to be um, the end of that story. The township's going to have to maintain this water body. Um, there's just no way around. So these are kind of our next steps. We have um, water chestnut removal plan in April. And then once that's done, uh, we're gonna come back in and do invasive species treatment with herbicide um, in the non you know, flooded areas. Um, this is what the site typically looks like when it's not um, right after a rain event. Um, so we'll target to do invasive species during that time. I'm sure all kinds of stuff are going to come up in this mud. Um, there'll be plenty for us to treat. And then at least two weeks after that, we're going to come back in and we're going to plant the heck out of this place. We've got 5,000 different plants going in. Um, and then we're going to come back in August to do the second invasive species treatment. Question on the water to April, it hasn't really bloomed yet. Come up until May. I have the same problem with water chestnut in my mind. Do you? And I treated it last year. Uh, I used weed ink and it was effective, but it doesn't pop up until May or June. Yeah, this is manual removal, so it's going to be. So it's not up on the. It's not floating. It does float. I mean, we've even seen it floating here. This is all um, oh, okay. on the right-hand side. That's water chestnut that's already come up after we've done the grading. Um, so it's so it's up now. It's up. Oh. Yeah, it's it comes up even in the winter. Oh. I mean, you're right that it it's mostly out. By in, May or June, it'll be floating and now. Yeah. But, you know, in order to basically stay in line with everything we've got coming up, we've got to hit the plantings this, um, like, early summer. So we just have to do it in a sequence, and townships, you know, it's going to fall on them to keep up with this. Um, so I always want to hear about plants when I'm doing presentations. Um, so this is going to be just completely covered in plants by the time we're done with it. Um, in a couple of years, this is going to be just a thriving ecosystem. And we've got um, four different zones, five different zones, including the live stakes. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of our key actors. Um, we've got pickerel weed, um, which will be installed within the inundated emergent wetland. They have these really large leaves and cluster systems that provide excellent cover for birds, insects, um, swimming mammals, and they also have these really dense root systems that are great at stabilizing shorelines from sediment erosion. Um, I guess I should back up a little bit. So the plants that we chose, we focused on um, all native species, um, but then also plants that were going to provide a diverse um, number of ecosystem benefits. Um, so not just, you know, going to be good for the birds and butterflies, but that we're also going to provide the stabilization that we needed for the pond. Um, and then this is a public park, so we wanted to make sure it was aesthetically pleasing as well. So we chose species that have different bloom times, um, so you're always getting that aesthetic um, value from the system. Um, sneezeweed, that's one species I wanted to highlight for the herbaceous wetlands. Um, despite its not so great name, um, they grow about five feet tall. They have these beautiful blooms um, in the late fall, and they're great for pollinators. Very attractive. Winterberry would be um, one of the key species in our scrub shrub wetlands. Um, they have these beautiful red berries during the uh, late fall, early winter, and are a very important food source for birds um, during that time when a lot of other things. 
Pinocks um, also have a very attractive color during fall, but not just oaks, but or not just pinocks, but oaks in general are great for um, host plants for a number of um, insects and birds. Um, so they're a great species that can tolerate wetter heat. So basically, um, in conclusion, you know, this project, um, when it's especially when it's is going to have a number of really great um, outcomes. Uh, water quality improvements is at the forefront of um, project objectives. So we're going to be having adequate flushing, stabilized sediments within the pond itself. Um, the system will be better at filtering and reducing total suspended solids and nutrients like phosphorus. Wetlands are crucial for um, improving groundwater replenishment. They slow water as they come into the system and allow that water to reabsorb um, into the ground. And then through the incorporation of especially the scrub shrub and forested wetland communities, um, we're going to have shadier, cooler water out here. Um, absolutely the goal is to reduce invasive vegetation on site. Um, this is going to be a maintenance and monitoring effort, as is any um, restoration project. You can't just let it go. Um, but it will be a highly valued habitat for native wildlife and fish. Um, and, we, and overall, we've created this, um, we've converted this kind of disgusting pond into a, a resource for the community that's accessible to anybody. Um, through these path networks and uh, boardwalks that are all ADA compliant. So um, overall, I'm really happy with the project and excited to be a part of it. Um, you can see all these turtles from the other day uh, basking on this one log, like just having a field day. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just thank Warrington Township and ARC, who are our partners in crime for this, and DCNR and POMS for um, the grant funding. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.